How's it going, everybody? Welcome to episode number 52 of Trail Tales. My name is Kyle O'Grady. I am a through hiker. I am a peak bagger. And every single week on this show, every single Wednesday, I chat with another through hiker, another peak bagger, or another hiking nerd like myself about their experiences on the trail. Rachel Meltzer is on the show this week. She is a fellow Appalachian Trail through hiker and a fellow hiking podcaster so we had a lot in common there folks i'm not gonna lie this is kind of a heavy episode rachel talks quite a bit in this episode about her mental health struggles and how that related to her appalachian trail through hike how her through hike was able to help her and yeah it was it, it was it was different than a lot of these episodes i'm gonna be honest and i mean that in a good way it was definitely something fresh I love doing the informational episodes of Trail Tales, and I really love doing the goofy episodes of Trail Tales, so those kinds of content will continue to happen here, but I just think it was cool that I was able to kind of branch out and speak to somebody who didn't just have positive things to say and didn't just have positive experiences to share. That being said, we still did have a lot of fun. Rachel, when you hear this, thank you so much for coming on, and thank you for being so honest and candid about your mental health as it relates to hiking in this episode. I think it was awesome, and I look forward to doing it again soon. YouTube, folks. That's right. YouTube. I've decided to do the YouTube thing. It's not really like a Trail Tales YouTube, but it's my own channel, and I'm going to be posting hiking videos there, Appalachian Trail related stuff, and once I actually get back outside, I'm going to be posting some trip videos too, so go search Kyle Hates Hiking on YouTube and smash that subscribe button, please. (laughs) There also will be a link in the show notes if you're too lazy to search on YouTube, so go subscribe there. If you don't want to subscribe on YouTube and you want to just stick to Trail Tales, that is fine too. At Trail Tales Pod is the Instagram. Go follow me on there. Send me a DM. Slide right into that shit. And you can also send me an email as well with any sort of advice or anything you want to say at all. That's trailtalespod at gmail.com. Go like it on Facebook as well. And don't forget to check out the Patreon. Patreon.com slash trailtales. Shout out to Steve, who is my latest patreon supporter he's from vermont which is really really cool and he pledged ten dollars a month instead of just five so steve i really appreciate that thank you so much with that said we're gonna get into the conversation here real quick but we're gonna do an itunes review or two very fast here so this one says new hiker excellent info and material i am a new hiker and this is a great source of information and true experiences on the trail i am on number three now and can't get enough Thanks. Well, wait till you hear the rest because those first couple episodes are pretty rough on my part. This next one says, telling tales. Kyle, okay, this is, this is a long one here. I'm going to go as fast as I can. Kyle, I live in Indiana, was driving to Colorado for a series of day hikes when I found your podcast. I proceeded to listen to the first 17 episodes while driving to and from Colorado. Damn, 17 episodes in a row. That's crazy. I'm not a through hiker, just a 49 year old weekend warrior, but I love your array of guests and all the experiences that they share. It has given this day hiker slash one to two night backpacker invaluable information and confidence. I'm pumped that I still have 30 episodes to go and inspired to try longer trips in the future, maybe a week on the AT segment next year, or maybe the foothills in South Carolina. You should definitely do that trail. It rocks. Thanks for offering this invaluable resource. (laughs) Terry in Indiana. Terry, thank you so, so much. Let's get into the episode, folks. Number 52 with Rachel Meltzer, Appalachian Trail Class of 2018. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Trail Tales. Rachel Meltzer is on the show. I got your last name right there, didn't I? You did, yeah. <laughs> I freaking nailed it. I'm on a roll with the last names. I haven't messed one of those up in a long time. Um, yeah. She, so Rachel, <laughs> she has through hiked the Appalachian Trail. She through hiked the same year that I did in 2018, and she also has a hiking podcast just like I do. So I feel like we're gonna have a lot to talk about today, Rachel. Uh, thank you so mm-hmm. much for taking the time and and coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. 
No problem. I I, I I hear you got a for sure in there. My my audience will make fun of me sometimes because and, and to their credit, like I definitely exaggerate the like the for sure is for sure is like quite sure. a bit. So the fact that you're already throwing some in there is just great. Like <laughs> see, I'm not it. the only one here, people. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. So good, so good. So why don't we start off by having you just explain a little bit? I know I just gave the very brief introduction to who you are, but <laughs> elaborate a little bit more why don't you start um pre appalachian trail through hike just talk about where you were in your life and what kind of inspired you to actually go out and do this 2000 plus mile walk yeah um before the at i went to college thought that i wanted to be a lawyer um i briefly went into politics after college and some um economics education programs for college students. And after being in politics for a while, realized that it was not for me um, <laughs> and that I did not want to spend the ridiculous amount of money that law school costs for the little gain that I would get from it. Yeah. So I was sort of lost. Um, I have been experiencing pretty severe depression since probably the age of 15. Um, and I've been medicated since the age of 15 until I left for the AT, which is um, when I stopped taking all of my antidepressants for the first time, um, which is like liberating and scary all at once. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the year before the AT, I was working full time at Starbucks as a barista, uh, living on my parents' couch. <laughs> <laughs> I saw YouTube videos and I was like following Instagrammers and I was living in Maine at the time. So like I knew about the AT, I've heard about it. I knew people who had hiked it, but I never in my entire life thought that I would hike the AT. It was not a goal of mine. I thought it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I kept seeing people come home and be like, oh yeah, my depression's so much better and my anxiety so much better. And I just feel like a totally different person and I know what I want to do now. And of course me thinking like this trail is going to solve all my problems was uh, sort of a joke, but also I was like, if this could help me, why wouldn't I try it? Because right. what's working, what I'm doing right now is not working and what I've tried isn't working. So um yeah, I left my cats with my parents and I I decided to go in October and I left in February. Okay, I gotcha. See, that's that's pretty crazy. I'm like, oh my God, there's so much shit I could like ask you about there. I'm just trying to decide like, where do you go next? Um, <laughs> like what path do you meander down and get lost in? <laughs> I know, right? I know. So, oh geez. See, this is where I should have had the questions, Rachel. Um, <laughs> everybody listening, I think I said this last episode too, but I'm trying to do this thing where I don't prepare as many questions ahead of time so I can try to do it a little more free flowing or whatever. That made no sense. But anyways, you know, you're going to end up on a tangent. It's a good thing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those pre-trail expectations that you just mentioned a second ago. Yeah. Did, did you say that you were expecting it to solve all your problems or you were at least hoping for that, even though you knew it was a little bit unrealistic, can you just kind of elaborate on those expectations a little bit more? Because I think that's fascinating, yeah. and that's something that I haven't really talked about on the show, at least in a long time. Mm, yeah, I think that like because my hiking experiences were only day hiking, I'd never been backpacking before. I didn't actually know what to expect. Um, so what I did expect was what I had seen on social media. And while people do post... <laughs> the bad thing sometimes obviously social media is not the whole picture yeah um i had no idea how i i don't want to say like dumb i was but i was a noob for sure i'd never <laughs> been backpacking i was very unprepared i was like oh i'm from maine and i'm going to georgia i don't need a zero degree sleeping bag <laughs> classic <laughs> it was fucking february <laughs> in the mountains yeah, i was forget it. such a clown it snowed it rained my first day my tent flooded and then it just like snowed so like all those pre-trail expectations obviously were completely just dismantled my first week but at the same time I still sort of expected to find some kind of like therapy in walking the trail and it's not to say that I didn't find that but it wasn't quite as easy as I was expecting like yeah. I would say pretty much until Pennsylvania I was spending a lot of my time 
with still struggling with my depression and my anxiety and like not necessarily wanting to be out there and camping and stuff. Um, I didn't even like camping until after Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I think a lot of the expectations I maybe I just didn't have the whole picture of expectation. Yeah, I guess that's that's what I would say. It's not to say that some of my expectations didn't come true, but I would say that I think it did sometimes hinder my hike because I wasn't ready to just appreciate like what was right there. Like someone had to tell me once, you're in an amazing place. It's incredible that you get to do this. You're so privileged right now and you're standing here whining. Mm. Look at like, look at where you're standing. <laughs> You've been dreaming about this for like six months and you're just standing here like whining. <laughs> now, now, um, see again, there's so much there. Uh, let's let's talk <laughs> let's let's talk about the social media thing for a second. Yeah. So we've been, you know, kind of interacting a little bit on Instagram pretty much since our show started because they both yeah. started around the same time. And I, I I'm just curious that so you mentioned a few minutes ago about how social media, generally speaking, not always, but generally doesn't give like a full picture of what through hiking is like. It usually tends to favor the the positive side of things. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you this question and then I'm going to give my answer as well because we're both pretty active on Instagram. Um, do you feel like your social media, at least your through hiking related social media, mm -hmm. um, is guilty of that kind of, I don't want to say hyping it up, but just mm -hmm. portraying one side of it? Um, I, I want to say no. Um, because if you do look back, like I had some really hard days where I just like, was bawling my eyes out, straight up took a selfie and posted it on Instagram and just mm -hmm. said like, this has been a, one of the mentally hardest days of my life. But I will say when I started, I very much was concerned with like, I was really self-conscious. Mm -hmm. I still kind of am. Um, and I was super concerned with the way people would perceive me because I'd started a blog um, before my through hike in part to get some funding for my through hike. Yeah. So I didn't want to seem like I couldn't do it or I wasn't going to finish or I wasn't like brave or strong or whatever. And I'm a woman going out and doing this by myself. Um, so I didn't want to seem like I was going to be easy to prey on. And I didn't want people to, I don't know. I was just afraid of all of these judgments. Mm -hmm. And I think in the beginning, my blog was very much just like a, I ate this, I went this far, I did this thing, this was the weather. Yeah. And then when I got more comfortable, it was much more like, we had this crazy day and all these experiences and these are the emotions I'm having and yeah, like de yeah. depression's still hard and all of this. But when I started, I don't think I showed the whole picture. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That's that's interesting. And honestly, when, when you first mentioned that, when you were talking about how you first discovered through hiking and all that stuff, I, I it got me thinking because... For myself, um, I, I don't really want to talk too much about what I posted during my through hike because that was mostly just to friends and family. I wasn't really actively trying to reach people back then like I am mm -hmm. now. On my account now, at Trail Tales Pod, everybody, you, you know where to find it. Um, <laughs> shameless plug. Uh, now, I feel like I tend to portray the more positive side of things. And, and anyway, so what I was thinking there while you were first saying that is okay, I generally do that, but is it necessarily a bad thing either? It's like, I'm mm. not being unrealistic. It's not like I'm I'm portraying things like to be even more positive than they actually are. I'm not lying. I just tend to only post like the cool shit. Yeah, and it's like, exactly. is that really that? I mean, and, and there's an argument to be made here both ways. I'm just trying to give mm -hmm. the argument that not most people wouldn't make, I guess, <laughs> play devil's advocate a little bit. <laughs> like, is that necessarily a bad thing? Like if it's cool content, you know, like why does it... Why does it really matter? And obviously, like, you don't want to mislead people. But at mm -hmm. the same time, uh, at, at least for me, I feel like I generally tend to research things pretty heavily. Like, I generally don't just go off of, like, a couple of videos or anything. Yeah, or, that's the thing. Anything. If you're not doing any research, like, you should be able to expect your audience to not take what you're saying at face value, especially about through hiking. There's so much through hiking content out there. Mm -hmm. There's no way... I mean, there is a way, but it is highly unlikely that they're not going to see the other side of it, too. Like, yeah. at least a taste of it. Yeah. So anyways, that's kind of my opinion. That's a, that's a hot mm -hmm. take. We'll see if that uh, if, if that kind of <laughs> sits with people right. But I don't know. It's like, at the same time, I feel like making good content out of the bad stuff is, like, super possible, too. And, and does happen, mm -hmm. um, like, like, fairly often, I guess. So it's not all just, just the positive stuff. But anyways, I... I 
I kind of wanted to go down that rabbit hole for a second based on your comments there. I, I think that's really yeah. interesting. I kind of want to go back to your reason for through hiking. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but just from what you said a few minutes ago, it sounds like your reason for through hiking was mostly kind of um, emotional or like mm-hmm. you're trying to improve yourself. Um, and the reason I kind of want to go back to this is because I always am so fascinated when I ask people that question. I get the people like you that have a very like specific um, personal reason why they want to through hike that has nothing to do with hiking. Mm-hmm. And then there's often people that are kind of like myself and the reason they want to do the AT is because they just fucking love to like hike, you know, and, like yeah. they just like like to camp and stuff. So I yeah. just thought that was pretty interesting. Can you uh, elaborate on maybe, you know, your your reason for through hiking a little bit more? Mm-hmm. I grew up in the whites of New Hampshire. Um Technically, I lived in Maine, but I was on the border. So, Freiburg, um, right? Yeah, it's like basically North Conway. Uh, the end of my street, the last mile is actually New Hampshire. So, gonna it's... totally cut you off there. I just gotta say, I drove through Freiburg. It's probably about a month ago now, mm-hmm. and it was during the Freiburg Fair. Oh my god! <laughs> Holy shit! That town was popping off. I've driven through there so many times over the years, but never like the weekend that the fair was going on. And yeah. there was like bumper to bumper traffic in like the middle of like <laughs> nowhere yeah. in Maine. I was like, "Holy shit! This this we fair is crazy." We used to take like a four by four truck down the power line path where the, like the ATVs <laughs> go to get around the fair traffic to get to the fair because my parents have worked the fair every year. My dad's on the fire department. I grew up volunteering in the fire department. Um, And he's also the, he's now the assistant chief of rescue. Mm -hmm. So he works the fair every year and we would just like (laughs) drive down these like not actual roads to get to the fairgrounds. It's funny because the population triples for the fair. I was going to say like it was absolutely unbelievable. And like I'd always seen like when when you drive through, it's like Freiburg, home of the world famous Freiburg fair or whatever. I'm like, okay, like, yeah, whatever. Just another another fair. Then I drove through and I was like, holy shit, that's, that's crazy. But anyway, sorry, I completely hijacked your question that I asked you there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. So I grew up in the whites. Uh, so I hadn't, I had been hiking a lot. Um, and I knew that I loved hiking and I knew that it made me feel better, but I didn't know that I would love it as much as I do now. (laughs) I'd never felt like a, specific joy the only time I felt real true like guttural joy from hiking the way that I did on the trail was the time that I did Lafayette um I did like a loop up to um the ridge sorry Franconia Ridge Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) and it was in college it was like 10 miles it literally took me 10 hours (laughs) with my friends Um, but it was like the best day ever. It was so hard. That is by far the hardest hiking I'd ever done before the AT. And I was not, I can't even believe I called myself a hiker before the AT. (laughs) Um, but it was like, it was hard. I drank so much water that day. The views were just incredible. And I got to the bottom feeling like closer with that friend than I ever had before. Interesting. And I, just sort of looked back on that three years later when I was deciding to hike like oh right I did do that thing I could do this sure (laughs) (laughs) um and yeah so but really it was an emotional thing it wasn't about the hiking like yeah it was great and it made me feel better but I was really out there I have tried virtually everything for my depression at that point I'd tried almost 12 different medications um with horrible side effects i would tried like meditation i would tried yoga obviously i don't i don't think now that i am a more calm person i actually tried those things as hard as i thought i did at the time Mm -hmm. um but i had you know checked them off my list i tried cognitive behavioral therapy i tried regular therapy (laughs) um i tried going back to school like i tried everything nothing made me feel better so this seemed like it's almost like, why not? Yeah. Like, it's what like do if I, I have could, to lose? Yeah. Like, maybe the extreme is the answer. Like, mm-hmm. what else could you do that's this extreme, that's this cheap, that has proven to work for other people? Yeah. I literally could not tell you a single thing. <laughs> that's 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 such an incredible story. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that guests, previous guests on the show, actually, I haven't had an, an Appalachian Trail episode in a long time, but... 
people mm. have alluded to you know various um circum like life life circumstances um as to the reason you know why they did a through hike but no nobody at least that i can remember and after doing this for an entire year now maybe i'm just starting to forget shit and like my audience is like kyle <laughs> you already talked about this but i'm pretty sure that nobody else has been like as candid as that and gone into mm. that much detail and perhaps even uh struggled that much before they started a through hike and started the through hike as a way to potentially you know end that or, or at least work on that struggle so i yeah. think that's really awesome rachel i'm i'm glad you're willing to kind of talk about this stuff openly and, and i know you you talk about it on your social media and stuff as well which is why i'm kind of okay probing you about it a little oh, bit oh yeah probe me all you want <laughs> i like being open about it i in college actually i don't like feel bad about this or anything <laughs> i tried to commit suicide in college i'm very open about it i would rather talk about it because no one was talking to me about it mm -hmm. and i think that's a big reason why i was having that problem yeah yeah um, well oh sorry go ahead no, I, sorry my cat is like climbing my dresser right now <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway what's your um, let's, let's see there i go again that's what's hard about the uh not, like when you I don't know, have a face to face every tangent right <laughs> there's no like there's no yeah you never know when to pause either um yeah. Yeah, so I like to talk about it on social media. I actually almost, I was a resident assistant at the time in college when I tried to commit suicide. And I ended up obviously in the hospital. And I came back and I asked them, like, are you going to fire me? Like, what's happening? And they were like, no, it's fine, but you have to take down all your social media about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. <laughs> That's uh, bizarre. I don't, why would they... I think it like puts a bad face on for the residence life team because their staff should have done uh, more to prevent it. I guess that, yeah. Um, which like is not untrue. I definitely went to my supervisor and told them I was feeling suicidal and they didn't do anything about it. But like, I also, I don't know. My <laughs> supervisor was like brand new. He had no idea what he was doing. I did like half his paperwork for him because he was like, it was the last <laughs> year that the college was even a thing, BU. Boston University ended up buying my college the next year um so it was just like this whole mess but they really didn't want it on my social media and I said no to taking it down because if if anyone I knew had been talking about like feeling that way or that like it is a thing and that it is okay and that you're not alone and that like there is support that's not just a counselor that you don't know like there is someone else mm -hmm. to talk to about it that's not your mom that's not a random counselor that's not like your boss, then I don't think I would have felt quite the same way that I did. So given that you do talk about this stuff, you know, on your social, on your trail name here, social media, mm -hmm. which why don't you give that a, I see, I always forget to do this stuff. Um, why don't you oh, plug your, your podcast and we'll do it again at the end, but just so everybody has a cool. little bit of contacts here and, and your social media. Yeah. Yeah. So my social media is uh, trail name here on Instagram. I have a personal Insta too, but you can find it through trail name here. I'm also on Facebook at trail name here and trail name here.com is my blog. I have a podcast. I call it podcast here. Um, you can find it anywhere you find podcasts and yeah, I'm writing a book about post trail depression right now. Um, shameless plug for that. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to get into that. We're going to get into that soon. We're going into that. Cool. Cool. Oh, we'll yeah. talk about it. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I just wanted, I just wanted to make it cause I, I mentioned that you had a podcast at the very beginning, but then I was like, I didn't even say the name of it. So yeah, a <laughs> yeah. podcast here, trail name here, all that good stuff. So anyways, on those platforms, you do kind of talk about, uh, a lot of what we've talked about or you've talked mm -hmm. about so far during this conversation. Have you had other hikers specifically or just, um, you know, circumstances relating to through hiking um has, has anything like that any hikers like that what a great way to phrase this question kyle uh, <laughs> has kyle anybody speaks. reached <laughs> reached out to you um about this stuff um like hikers you know because of your podcast and your social media that's what i was trying to say there. uh yeah can you talk about that a little bit yeah yeah very much so actually i've had quite a few hikers reach out and just um there's one girl actually that messages me about once a month, just like saying, hi, I love her so much. She, I've never, I've literally never met her in person. Um, she attempted to through hike the AT and ended up section hiking. And um, she reaches out to me randomly and just lets me know, like, thanks for sharing this. It mm -hmm. makes me feel so much better. Um, and we just talk, we have like, you know, paragraph long messages or whatever, but I have a few people that are like that. Um, 
there's one guy who used to message me every day and I literally had to say, I want to be supportive of you, but please message me once a month. I'm only one person. I think you (laughs) might need a therapist, but it's good to hear that it's helping somebody else and that I can't, like, I love talking to people about it, not love as in like, it brings me joy to see your pain. Of course, of course. Um, I love it because to me, it's like, that's the kind of community I want to foster is people who are willing to talk about this kind of stuff. And I've even had hikers reach out to me to be like, hey, I'd love to be on your podcast. It seems like I'd be a good fit because we do on podcast. I, I like to touch on the emotional aspect. I like to hear like how it felt to through hike, what it feels to come home, why you left. Mm-hmm. Like, do you experience depression? Did you experience it on trail? That kind of stuff. Um, and one of my favorite podcast episodes that I did was with this guy, um, Boston Mule. He is almost a triple crowner, (laughs) Um, but he also hiked the AT to work on his mental health. So it was really cool to talk to somebody else who sort of had the same trajectory and he's now starting to freelance right as well, just like me. So it's, it's nice to have a community of like-minded individuals, much like the trail, um, but like online. Yeah, definitely. And I think covering that stuff is something that really sets you apart and, and I'm sure other hikers, and I know for a fact other hikers do talk about this stuff, but it, it's mm-hmm. really kind of like a, like, what's the right word? I See, the first word that came to mind there was part of your brand, and that just makes it sound like so corporate. And that's not what I mean, but like, it is <laughs> like, it, yeah. it's like a staple of your content, basically. Yeah, and, it's on brand. <laughs> and, and, and basically, I, I think that's really cool. And that's something that is pretty different than this show. I generally, I'm a pretty like... Not that you're not easygoing, but I'm like Mm -hmm. a very much like a surface level kind of person. Like I don't read into things too much. Most Mm -hmm. of my show is at least an attempt at being informative. Like I do a lot of episodes where I'll have people come on and they will talk about maybe a trail that's not as popular that they've through hiked that, you know, and I try to like educate people on these, these lesser known trails and just like teach people about like through hiking and, and all this other stuff, the whites and Adirondacks and all this stuff. But generally... I don't go as in on the emotional stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes there are moments, but it's it's not as often. So I think it's really cool that we're getting a chance to talk about this stuff. And if you're listening to Trail Tales and you wish I did more of that stuff, well, now you have <laughs> another podcast to go listen to that does cover that stuff. Maybe maybe I should try to get more into it. Um, I kind of want to <laughs> I kind of want to place you back on the Appalachian Trail now. I believe. At the beginning of the interview, you said something along the lines of it wasn't until you were in Pennsylvania that you were kind of starting to feel less depressed. Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to hear how attempting a through hike when you're dealing with depression like that, like, like how that would mm-hmm. would play out. Because obviously, a lot of my audience knows this, and you know this certainly, Rachel. Like a through hike is freaking hard, and even even yeah. someone who's in the best like physical shape and the best mental shape is still going to have a hard time on a through hike so like adding a whole nother element of difficulty in there just sticks out to me i guess and i kind of want to hear about your experience dealing with that yeah sure um well i'm gonna preface this with saying i did take seven months to do my through hike uh and for good reason (laughs) (laughs) i so I started in February mostly because I thought I wanted to be alone more and I was afraid of um, not having enough time to finish. And because I, I knew I would be working through all of these things and I didn't I didn't want to put limits on that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to like figure out how to how to phrase this. I, th- I think I know what you're saying there. I know what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. OK, so you're setting yeah, yourself so- up for success as much as you can. Yeah, basically, uh, which is hilarious because, like, gear-wise, I did not do that. <laughs> but mentally, like, I read Appalachian Trials, and I was like, all right, Zach Davis, I'm going to go do this now. <laughs> <laughs> right, r- make your list. Write down your reasons. <laughs> yeah, I, d- totally. I did that, too. It's okay. <laughs> I did my reasons, and then I looked back on it my first week, and I was like, who the fuck does this girl think she is? What is <laughs> This is a joke. Um, but I went through a lot of phases. I would say, like, I think I went through three chapters. Like, the first part was very hard. I was looking for sort of support from other people who I should not have expected to like give me support. I was very like, I had a hard time being alone. I still have a hard time being alone. Um, 
fun fact, I like grew up sharing a room with my sister for a really long time. <laughs> and after that, like, oh my God, I couldn't be alone for so long. It's still hard. Interesting. Um, yeah. So like being alone and just knowing how to talk to other people without just like oozing my problems on them for some reason was hard for me. I hated camping. I did not have any idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and so that whole first chapter was just like being a noob and figuring out even, I think I just had such a lack of empathy because I was so, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but a lot of people who have depression dissociate. So you sort of like, don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of almost like I don't see other people as like a human like me. They're like a different kind of human. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel the same feelings they're feeling. I, like the empathy connection is almost gone for some reason. And it's just, I don't know, it's just a weird side effect of depression. But when I first got out there, I was dissociating a lot. I had no idea how to really like make friends for some reason. And I tried, I did have friends, but I think, I got to the Smokies and I was just having a really hard time. It was snowing. My sleeping pad was defected. I had borrowed a synthetic sleeping bag from somebody because my sleeping bag wasn't warm enough. I had 55 pounds on my back. I was just a disaster, Yikes. dude. <laughs> Walked into the Smokies in a blizzard. Oh, jeez. My first night or my second night in the Smokies, I was in a shelter with 30 other people. There was nowhere to sleep. Wait, 30, um, like 30 people in the shelter? 30 people in the shelter because the people who had slept <laughs> there the night before I got there didn't leave because it was Damn. a blizzard. You see, Rachel, I left, I started northbound on May 14th, so I was like, <laughs> way behind the bubble. I missed winter completely. Like, I, I had oh such God. a different experience. So I always love hearing these stories from people <laughs> who actually started at, I mean, I know February is still a little bit early, but yeah. um, <laughs> you started at a more traditional time than like totally. mid-May. So that's incredible. 30 freaking people in a shelter. It was so packed. I got there and like my first reaction, of course, was anger. Um, <laughs> and I think I've told this story a few times on my podcast. So like if you listen to my podcast, you'll hear it again in more detail. Um, but there was one guy there, Josh, who I became friends with. I actually talked to him on the phone today. Oh, um, nice. He basically he's from New York. And you know how like New Yorkers and Bostonians are like always on the opposite <laughs> team, you know, yeah. sort of jabbing at each other. And he just made like a straight up joke jab at me and I was like oh that's how you want to play it <laughs> and we sort of became friends so like then I just tried to make friends with everybody there instead of being angry that I had to sleep on the muddy ground yeah. you know and once I sort of embraced that I was like oh okay if you just embrace all the bad stuff it's not as bad right <laughs> so after that experience it sort of got it's just very slowly gradually got better but josh was great to hike with because he was not afraid to just point out like you're being really mean right now mm. you need to stop or like you're being really negative everything's okay look at all this great stuff that's happening uh -huh. um he's the one who was like look at look at this great place okay, here and okay. you're just whining <laughs> yeah um so that that was really helpful to find friends like that that weren't afraid to like point it out to you um, and then after that, I, I hiked alone until uh, for basically the rest of like North Carolina to Virginia, there was a short section where I hiked fully alone. And that was a huge learning experience for me because I had to be alone with my thoughts and my phone died at one point. So I had no <laughs> podcast, like there's no distraction anymore. Uh -huh. um, and that really was where I sort of started like teaching myself to like trying to figure out what I really wanted, I guess. And then uh, in Virginia, I met up with this guy, Ted, who I had met in Fontana Dam. Um, we actually started dating on trail. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, and we hiked together for the rest of the trail. We were never apart after that. And he was very much like, you need to be more positive. It's okay to be positive. Like, I guess when you get when you're depressed for so long, you get to a point where like negative is your thought pattern and it's just okay. And it's uncomfortable to change that. Yeah. Um, so like sitting with the mental discomfort of like of that kind of thing was really important um, and really hard. <laughs> yeah. And there were, I think the days that were like more than 20 miles were the days where I really confronted shit because you push yourself and then you get to a point, like when I started, I was hiking eight miles a day, right? So when I started doing 20 mile days, that was huge for me. And I would get to a point where 
like I, the first day we did 20 miles, I sat down and I was just bawling. I couldn't handle it anymore. We're like 18 miles in. I'm like pouring sand out of my shoes, just (laughs) crying. (laughs) I had holes in my shoes because I'd been wearing them for like 700 miles. And I just couldn't, I, I truly thought I could go no further. My body hurt. I was like, let's just fucking camp here. I had no food left and I just did not have any strength in me to be nice to anybody at that point. And he was like, no, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. So the two of us, me and Miles, just walked all the way to Woods Hole Hostel and we got there and that was the best shower of my life. And I had no idea that these things could feel so good because you like suffered first. Yeah. I had never felt, I also had been on antidepressants for so long that feeling these feelings was like kind of foreign. Mm -hmm. Like the, the like extreme joy that you get to get a shower after seven days or whatever, or like to get a burger in town or whatever it is, the like extreme joys you feel on trail, you just are not ever going to feel if you're on antidepressants. It's not, it's, I would say personally, I think that is impossible to feel that way on medication. So it was cool to experience that. And then sort of, I just, I don't know, I don't even know how I worked through it. It's one of those things where you just walk and your brain sort of acts differently because you're hiking. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, you get definitely. into a flow state and it just sort of sorts through the things and files them away for you. And granted, I did a lot of talking to myself. I did so much crying. I spent quite a few days where I just did not, I probably could have gotten up, but I really didn't want to. And I would just take a zero in my tent and then regret it the next day when I didn't have enough food. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. Or like spend a whole day in your tent just eating one bag of chips and being like, well, I'll just hike tomorrow. Rachel, when did you finish <laughs> again? September 28th. Okay. So we, we were close. You were, yeah. so I started May 14th. I finished October 1st. So we were like super close, but I guess um, you finished just before me. So our paths never crossed. That just popped in yeah. my head. I was trying it's to think. It's funny because like, I bet you we probably like saw each other on trail at one point like one time and maybe just didn't know yeah who knows who knows it's funny when i had a scott hughes on the first time who i know you've had on the show yeah i love him he's so funny he's hilarious (laughs) yeah um we were trying to figure out because he hiked south and we were trying to figure out where we passed each other and then eventually Mm -hmm. we just like gave up for like we know we did because like we were on trail at the same time different Mm -hmm. directions but we just like couldn't figure it out i vividly remember passing him because of his hair yeah i I remember you said that in that in your episode with him (laughs) possible to forget (laughs) he's so funny shout out to shout out to hell yeah jesus (laughs) um (laughs) let's talk a little bit about post trail life for you rachel Mm. so um so you went out to the appalachian trail with at least an attempt to find something that would make you feel a little bit better or or at least with a hope that that could happen even if you weren't fully expecting it to happen Mm -hmm. how how did i guess um like how did it work out i mean obviously you made it the whole way have you felt better since then like do you think it actually made that impact that you were hoping for the broad answer is yes, very much so. Um, the more deep answer is it is way more complicated than I thought it would be. Well, perfect. <laughs> let's let's go into it then. That's what we're here for. Okay. So I think on trail, basically between Pennsylvania and Maine, I very much found um, a lot more peace. I started to worry less. I started to realize that I was capable of a lot more things than I thought I was. I like gained more confidence. Um, I used to have this like chronic back pain for years and it started to go away. It completely went away on trail. Um, and it turns out it was just like stress related, like clenching of my back muscles. Interesting. See, yeah. most people have like get back pain from through hiking. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I told my doctor I was going to through hike and he was like, you're an idiot. You have back pain. <laughs> um, but it was truly, I think a large majority of the problems I was having were from stress and depression. And my anxiety was like at an all time low. When I got home, I, I got home, my parents, because they lived in Maine, helped me out a lot in New England. Like once I got to Musawaki, their rule was they would not come see me in person until the whites. They did actually come visit me in New York though. 
Um, but <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> their whole role was like, we're not going to help you until the whites. And when I got to the whites, they like came and picked me up and brought me home. And they told me when I got home from trail that when they picked me up at Moose I was a totally different person than the person they dropped off. Interesting. They, it was very, for me, it felt like a compliment because I really was not proud of the person I was when I left and how I treated them. And like, I was living with them. I was a horrible kid to live with. Oh my God. <laughs> I just look back at that. And I just like, I apologize so many times to my parents now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely experienced what I had hoped to experience, but it was a lot harder than I had expected. Um, and I came home and I, I definitely had some post-trail depression. I definitely, I would not call it an easy time. My living situation was kind of weird. I didn't have, I had $400 when I got home. <laughs> so I was living with my parents. They live in a trailer, like a double wide. Um, it only has like one bedroom and I slept on their couch for a few months while I renovated a camper trailer in their backyard, which Miles also moved into with me. Um, so we had no plumbing. We had a wood stove and a oh, bed geez. and a table and some like <laughs> jugs of water. Um, and that was life in Maine in the winter. Yikes. Like it snowed in October. It oh, snowed... I remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it, yeah. Yeah. It snowed so early that year, we couldn't even, like, gather firewood. Like, we had to buy firewood, <laughs> um, which was, like, obviously not an expense I could afford. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, it was just insane. My dad was nice enough to buy me a laptop, um, and I tried really hard to pay him back for it, but he didn't want to, so that I could start freelance writing, um, which was, like, something I'd never done before again. Um, so I just went into coming home in the hardest possible way that I could have. I had like a horrible living situation. I was starting a new career that I had no idea what I was doing, but I thought it would be the best thing to set me up for the life of adventure that I realized that I wanted when I was on the AT. Yeah. Spoiler, I did decide to like camping. <laughs> <laughs> I basically after Pennsylvania, I realized like if you choose to be positive about something, you choose to like it and you just go into it with like, how what is the best and most beautiful thing about this thing then you like eventually come to love it and that's sort of what happened with camping with me so now when I'm really hating something I try to find like the best thing about it um I'm having a really hard time doing that with pitching for writing but you know <laughs> um that's one of those trail lessons that's like kind of hard to bring home as well yeah um but I basically just had a hard time also with having changed so much on trail and coming home to the home that like I spent my childhood in with De all the same people. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Now that you're more than a year out from when you threw hike, you know, I can understand immediately after you finish, obviously you, the adjustment is hard. I went through that. I feel like most through hikers go through that, but now that you've had a lot of time since your through hike, do you feel like you were able to kind of get the positive impact that you were hoping for? Yeah. Um, I definitely think so. I am. So right now, I actually just posted about this on my social media. It is the time when normally seasonal affective disorder would hit me really hard. I would be super depressed. And while I am still experiencing that, it is nothing like what I've experienced in the past. I am so much more positive when I do get down or like in a rut, it lasts for maybe a day or two. And I know how to get myself out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been turning a lot more to like trail running and rock climbing, which are things I never would have done if I hadn't experienced the AT. Um, I'm much better at like sitting and meditating. Um, I think overall I'm a calmer person and yeah, a lot of the things like the things that I was struggling with before was just constant stress and anxiety, especially surrounding money, um, constant depression and a severe lack of confidence. And while I do still struggle with like imposter syndrome sometimes, I wouldn't say that I have no confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like the negative self-talk has definitely gotten better as well. So I think overall, yes, there's definitely a lasting impact. And it's funny because <laughs> the other day I was just telling um, my friend Paul, who is also an AT through hiker from 2015, I was telling him how 
it feels like I've done nothing in the past year. And it's like, how did I, how has it already been a year since I got home from the trail? And he was like, how has it already been four since I got home? Yeah. I don't freaking know. <laughs> I, like, that's just how it's going to be. But then I started looking back at the year and like, I've moved four times. I'm a freelance writer supporting myself now. I'm in a completely different state than where I started. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like saving up for van life. That's insane amount of progress, but it's hard to see when you're like in it sometimes, you know? Definitely. Definitely. This past year flew by for me too. It's absolutely crazy. Um, yeah. So you mentioned earlier, you're going to be writing a book on post-trail depression. I've been seeing on your Instagram, you're looking for people to do your survey and all that stuff. So everybody that's through hike, you should definitely go check that out on, on Rachel's Instagram. But um, why there's a lot of topics that you could write a book on that relates to <laughs> through hiking. Why did you choose post-trail depression specifically? That's a really good question, Kyle. Thank you. Thank I... you. Nobody compliments my questions. That feels great. Thank you. <laughs> I have no idea how to even answer that. I The best questions basically... cannot be answered easily. <laughs> I think when I got home, because I had written the blog, my first idea was like, I'm going to write a book about my through hike. And when I sat down to start writing it I was like this is the worst idea I've ever had in my life <laughs> like I don't know how to encompass everything that happened to me in a book when like Cheryl Strait is out here writing about her section hike like yeah. an absolute beast and it took her like 15 years to write that book there is no way I'm producing this in the amount of time I thought I was going to in the way that I wanted to without a offending people b <laughs> doing it justice and c like not killing myself for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I sort of like put it on the back burner, but I was still working on it. And then the more I was doing my podcast and talking to people, the more I realized like people aren't really talking about, like people talk about post-trial depression, but it's not like very few people actually know what to do about it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of different experiences surrounding it, but somehow we can all relate to it all those different experiences. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but I just sort of developed this like weird obsession with it. And I wanted to talk to people more about it. So my first thought was like, oh, I'll write an article about it because I write for the Trek as well. And I proposed it to Maggie and she was like, well, someone's kind of already doing that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe I won't do that. But I still was talking to people about it. And then I sat up in bed at like five o'clock in the morning one morning and just thought, a post-trail depression guidebook. What? It, why didn't I think of this earlier? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, if you put in the work for long enough, you'll get this random epiphany. And, it, like, writers often say, like, oh, this book idea just came to me. And that was the moment I realized, like, no, that book idea didn't just come to you. You worked for that idea. Yeah. Like, Appalachian Trials is great. And Zach Davis sort of covers post-trail depression a little bit. And he actually, back on his through hike interviewed Miss Janet about what to do about post-trail mm -hmm. depression. Um, and I thought that was great, but it's sort of just a, like a little nugget. It's not when you get home, you're not looking to like go back and read Appalachian trials again. It's not going to make you feel better. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, I was hoping to put together sort of a resource for through hikers for when they get home. So, um, research about it, like, Hey, you're not the only one experiencing this. Um, here's what to do about it. Here's some other hikers experiences that you can relate to and, even maybe reach out to um and like here's what i went through and like you're gonna be okay everything's gonna be great you know yeah yeah definitely i i think it's a really cool idea because i granted i haven't really looked into it that much but to my knowledge mm -hmm. there's kind of like you said there's not too much out there that covers it so i i think that's definitely definitely going to be helpful and i'm looking forward to it i also think it's cool that you're not just going to write it all based on your experience and that you are placing so much emphasis on getting input from other through hikers because obviously like everyone's experience is going to be different and I feel mm -hmm. like that will just give you like a better overall idea of like how you might be able to kind of cope with this I guess so I, I think that's a really yeah. awesome idea. Like I didn't want to write a guidebook for other people without knowing what they're going through. Like mm -hmm. I want part of it to be a workbook and I'm not going to write it unfounded. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there's so little research about post-trail depression out there that I didn't really have anything to like 
look at and and base that on. So I did make a survey um, based on a few different psychological surveys, but also just with questions that would be helpful to me. Um, And that is up in the link in my bio on my Instagram. It's also on the main page of my website, trail name here. So if you guys are interested in, your listeners are interested in um, helping me out with research, go take that survey. It's pretty short and there is uh, a chance to win an REI gift card. Oh, so. nice. They're, they're yeah. just about to open up an REI here in the uh, Burlington, Vermont area. So Ooh. I'm going to have to go fill that out. Um, <laughs> okay. So we, we both have podcasts. We're, you know, getting towards the end here. We haven't even talked about podcasts yet. So why, <laughs> why did you decide to start a uh, podcast after you got back? Um, I met, well, A, I have always wanted my own podcast. Like, I'm an NPR nerd. I cannot even tell you how many times I have applied to be the Planet Money intern. Like, it's <laughs> embarrassing, honestly. Um, <laughs> so I've always wanted my own podcast, but I didn't think it was possible. And I was hiking because I have no experience in any of this. Um, and when I was hiking, one of my hiking buddies was like, girl, why don't you just start a podcast? Like, all you have to do is do it. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And she was like, just Google it. (laughs) So I literally just Googled it and ordered the most recommended mic. And I honestly, like, it's great that you use a service to record through the internet. I literally just put my phone on speakerphone next to a microphone (laughs) and just talk to people. (laughs) Um, But it works and it's fun. Um, I've been changing things up and learning. I just got a Skillshare subscription. So I've been learning a lot about podcasting lately and sort of implementing it one by one on the show. But um, the reason I started the podcast I did specifically was because I love the casual conversation podcasts. Like there are some, I don't love Joe Rogan. I don't want to like tout him, but there are some episodes of his show that actually changed my life that made me feel like, okay, the things I want to do are possible. Um, And I had no idea that like this person was experiencing these emotions. Like he goes at it from a casual conversational perspective. And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of podcasts, like while they are casual and conversational, it's very surface level or they like, um, or informational. Like It's an interview, right? Yeah, and it's not bad that it's an interview. It's like that's content that's needed too. But I think there was like that link missing, like you said, where like, someone talking, speaking to the deeper things of hiking. Um, So I really wanted to talk to not just hikers. I'm hoping to expand beyond that. Once I get into van life, talk to more van lifers and things like that. My big idea was that it would be a traveling podcast and it will eventually, but right now it's pretty stationary. Gotcha. Gotcha. I I think that's awesome. And uh, the thing about like trying to keep it like conversational is definitely worth noting as well. I feel like for me, because that's another thing I've tried to do on the show, it's like generally I don't dive into the super emotional stuff like I kind of mentioned earlier, but Mm -hmm. I still try to add my input where I can, and I try to make it feel more conversational than interview wheel or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I feel like sometimes I've succeeded with that. Sometimes I haven't. Sometimes it's just hard to, because it also depends on the guest. Like I've had guests before that in in you know to their credit it, it is an interview so they i think mm-hmm. they come into it more with that in mind totally. and so it, at the end of the day it really just ends up being an interview and that's fine i mean these mm-hmm. interviews are like super informative like i'm not saying like interviews are a bad thing but i do generally try to at least stay away from that as much as i can and sometimes i succeed sometimes i don't <laughs> but it's okay i i i, I think it's awesome that we both have freaking hiking podcasts Um, yeah it's crazy that like there's more than one hiking like there are other hiking podcasts other than ours too and it's nice that like it's kind of like the coffee industry like there's it's not competition it's just like another place is here and they're Mm -hmm. doing their thing and you're doing your thing and it's they each have their own merits and their own followers you know yeah um but it's cool that we get to just like talk to fucking hikers oh yeah (laughs) for fun (laughs) it's my it's my outlet because after my through hike there was no way that my roommates were gonna like just be able to put up with me talking about hiking constantly i know (laughs) i know totally and it's nice too because that was one of my favorite parts about the trail is having that like that conversation without the barrier like i think a lot of people in the the synthetic world as some people like to say (laughs) the world we come back to after through hiking 
aren't they have sort of like some walls up some emotional walls you can't just like talk to them about poop and hard times and <laughs> you know like the the stuff that hikers talk about they on can't trail. Relate to it, yeah yeah so it, it's cool that like I get to have these meaningful conversations with people. Like there are days, I'm not going to lie, where I've like scheduled a podcast for 7 p.m. And I'm like, oh gosh, I don't want to do this interview right now. But every single time I get on it and I have such a good conversation, whether it's positive or hard or whatever, and I come out the other side and I'm so glad I started the podcast and that it like is a meaningful conversation that brings fulfillment to me, which means that it's going to bring fulfillment to someone else, you know? I, th- I think that's so awesome because I literally have had the exact same experience, Rachel. Like, <laughs> like literally, I could not have worded it better than you. Like, there's been many times, like, more than I'd like to admit, where before the interview, and it, maybe it's because I do most of my interviews right when I get home from work, pretty much. Yeah, and I'm just, like, same. kind of still in that, like, manic, like, whatever mood. And mm-hmm. I'll be like, uh, it's not that I, like, don't want to talk to them it's not that I don't care, but it's just like in that moment, I just don't really feel like it, you know, like I'd rather mm-hmm. be doing something else or whatever, or just, you know, decompressing from the day. But every single time, once the conversation actually starts, even before the recording starts, even when I'm just chatting with them before, um, kind of just going over, you know, how it works and all that stuff. And we just kind of start shooting the shit. It's like, it always just clicks then. And it always yeah. feels right then. And I could definitely say that I've never, held on to that like not wanting to do it feeling for longer than you know a minute into talking to Mm -hmm. somebody which is i think it's awesome that you can relate to that and you've (laughs) had a a similar experience um rachel we're pretty much at the end of this episode and my listeners are going to kill me for this but at the end of these episodes i always have my guests share a story from one of one of their hikes or whatever just a, a hiking story and i know you've shared a lot of stories today (laughs) <laughs> and usually I'd say about uh, 65% of the time, 70% of the time, if I'm being generous, I tell my guests this before we record so that they can think of one because mm-hmm. hikers have a lot of stories. And when I don't tell them this before, I always say it on recording so that my guests knows I'm not just completely putting them on the spot. Well, I am putting on the spot, but <laughs> they know that like I like I accept responsibility if it's kind of hard to think of one. So and so my audience knows that too. So everybody, I forgot to tell Rachel. I am sorry. Um, I, I, fuck. Like, I don't even know. Um, cool. With that said, Rachel, if you need a minute to think about it, that's, that's totally sure. cool. Any um, story? <laughs> any trail story, anything, you know, say, let's say you're I don't know, at a bar, you're sitting around a campfire or something and somebody asks you, just like whatever that like go-to story from the trail would be. That's what I'm looking for here, if that makes sense. (laughs) Okay. Oh, man. Do you ever like, did you keep a trail journal? No, I didn't. Okay. I, whenever someone asks me this question, I just see my trail journal pages just like flipping by my face. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Hmm. And this is why I remind people, folks. It's hard because it's <laughs> How like long if someone can we sit here? Because <laughs> it's like if, if somebody asked me, it's like I don't fucking know. Like I've got so many stories. Like... I know it's like you immediately <laughs> drop blank. It's like I didn't even through hike. I don't even know. I don't yeah, even right. Know like did I even <laughs> did I even do it? <laughs> that was a different person. Sorry, sir. Um, okay, I guess I feel like this is the one your listeners would love the most based on your previous episodes. Okay. Cool. All right. So when I got to the whites, my mom really wanted to hang out with me. She missed me a lot, I could tell. And she was kind of texting me in Massachusetts being like, I could slack pack you through the whites and, you know, you could like sleep at home and shower (laughs) and I can wash your gear. She was so excited to wash my gear because she thought I smelled so bad when she saw me in New York. So I was like, you probably did. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think it had been like, eight days so nice. I don't yeah I don't blame her for thinking that at all um yeah so I initially was like there's no way this is going to work out because if you look at the map where the road gaps are the only way to get over Mount Washington on a slack pack is to do 27 miles unless you're going to take the auto road down or the cog mm-hmm. right so I was like, "There, this isn't going to work out, mom. Like, we shouldn't even try. And she was like, well, just try. Like, the Kinsmans aren't that hard. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, you've never hiked the Kinsmen. You have no idea. <laughs> so we did. We hiked the Kinsmans. It was like a 22. 
at a 22 mile day and we got to the end feeling shockingly good like i was thinking this is the whites like i'm i don't i'm still afraid of the whites i'm from there i <laughs> obviously have made it through them fine but i'm still afraid um i know this guy who does like the avalanche coordination on mount washington and his stories i'm just like yeah that's a dangerous place man it is yeah <laughs> so we did like the Kinsmans and the Wildcats and everything. We did that whole section up to like Rattle. Wait, is it Rattle River? What's the the hostel? Like the last hostel in the Whites. Um. Yeah. It is. It is. Is that Rattle River? Rattle River. I think. I didn't stay okay. there, but I know there's a Rattle River shelter there. I think. So I. I yeah. It's right before you cross. Route right two before the main to, border. To go into Gorham. Yeah. 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 Right near Gorham. Yeah. So we agreed. After doing this crazy day, me and Miles agreed my mom was going to slack pack us over Mount Washington. And then we thought of an even better idea. At the time, I had this van. You can see her on my Instagram if you're really excited about it. Um, she was a 85 Volkswagen Vanagon with a converted engine. So the engine was actually a BMW engine. We called her Abby as an Abby normal from young Frankenstein. Anyway, we were all like, we're going to take Abby and like, just go camp at the trailhead and it'll be fine. And like, if you know anything about Vanagons, I'm sure you know that they break down a lot. Um, <laughs> and we set out at like 10 o'clock the night before after having dinner with my parents to go park at the trailhead. And I was in North Conway, right in front of the old Eastern Mountain Sports that's now REI. And the radiator just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at Miles and I'm like, this is a bad idea, dude. Why are we doing this? <laughs> We're never going to make it 30 miles over Mount Washington. This is insane. Like the van is telling us not to do this. So <laughs> we get the car towed back to my, my parents own a car shop. So I got it towed back to their shop and we get back there and my parents are like, it's fine. You know, just, just take our station wagon you should just go like it's gonna be great don't worry so we take their fancy ass bmw station wagon up to <laughs> it's fancy to me it's like really not fancy it's like not even a new car for but... hikers it's fancy yeah i was like i'm used to driving this like old broken down van so <laughs> <laughs> we take it up the trailhead and we're like sleeping in it and it's on a hill and you know how i guess a lot of new cars have auto leveling systems which i didn't know and so the whole night, every time you roll over, it just goes <laughs> like up and down. <laughs> and I was just terrified that we were going to like roll this thing down the mountain into the, you know, because we're up in like one of the notches with no cell service. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it turned out to be fine. So we had a very bad night's sleep, got up at two o'clock in the morning and we just started hiking. And we got up Webster Cliffs like right as the sun was about to rise. Oh, and nice. I... I have goosebumps talking about it. I've literally never experienced something so beautiful. It was amazing. Like, Katahdin was great, but this felt so much better for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we just sort of, like, the first two hours was just in the dark. So you almost forget that they happened. And you just keep going. And we just went, like, hut to hut and just stopped and took breaks when we needed to. And we had snacks. And we just talked. And then... I guess like halfway through the day, we just stopped talking to each other because it was just too hard to yeah. keep talking. And by the time we got up to Mount Washington, I, I've hiked Mount Washington so many times. Like obviously our school, I don't know if your school, well, oh, you're not from New Hampshire, from Vermont. Um, a lot of schools in, <laughs> in like Maine and New Hampshire do it for field trips. So like I've had a field trip up there. I, you know, I've been up there and I'm just standing on top of Mount Washington watching you know the auto road people like in their sandals and their shorts and their like normal people street clothes standing on top of mount washington after you just like sweated your ass off to get up there just dying <laughs> i'm just staring at these people thinking like this is purgatory yeah. this is so weird the whole sum is surrounded in clouds um it was really bizarre and so we kept hiking we're on our way down now and I just started to crash hard. It was awful. I felt like the worst I think I've ever felt while hiking. And 
Miles gave me a Lara bar and he was like, yeah, it's fine. Just like eat this Lara bar. You'll feel better. <laughs> I ate like a Lara bar and a whole liter of water and some crackers. And I just kept walking. And for some reason, like that was all I needed, but I've never felt that low before that like hard sugar crash. It was rough. So we kept going. We made it to the bottom. We like jogged it into Pinkham Notch and I got in the car and I was like, mom, I could totally just like hike another three miles right now. <laughs> that's how she remembers. That's how she told me I told it. And I was like, just absolutely dead looking. Yeah, I could just hike another three miles. It was great. It was the best day. It felt so good to like get to the bottom and just be like, yeah, we just hiked that far Hell over yeah. that terrain. I, that was the day that I was like, I'm going to do an ultra someday, you know? Nice. Nice. But that was, I guess, drawn out. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, Kyle. I think we're going to kind of wrap it up here. Why don't you plug your social media and your website and your podcast one more time so people can go find you on all that stuff? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at trail name here facebook.com slash trail name here and trail name here.com you can find my podcast on any one of those um it's also called podcast here um and please please if you're a hiker take the survey i want to hear from section hikers through hikers anybody so take the survey it's in the link in my bio on insta it's all over my facebook and it's the first link on my homepage of my website awesome awesome thank you so much rachel thank you everybody for listening and have a good one mm-hmm.